So, hi there. Welcome to the presentation about um, single sign-on and fine-grained authorization in the cloud. Uh, my name is uh, Oliver Wolf. I'm uh, based in uh, Switzerland, in Zurich. And what, I, what I'm telling or explaining to you today is really based on um, customer use cases, which finally, finally became a sub-project of um, uh, CXF. So brief introduction about myself. So my role with the customer is a little bit different, sometimes a principal engineer, sometimes a solution architect. I have quite a lot of experience with web services, started with um, Axis or even with, um, how was it called, Apache SOAP before, and ended up now with CXF. Security was always a key thing, independent whether it was um, uh, web services um, uh, or Corba. Um, I'm not only developing um, uh, in Java, uh, there are still, I uh, have to do some things in uh, C++ or C Sharp for the Microsoft platform. I'm a Apache CXF PMC member and um, uh, I'm working for Talent. Um, you see a, a lot about the history of, the, of this Apache uh, CXF edits project I'm, uh, on my blog and you can reach me on this email address. So the agenda does look like this. I will initially start with the challenges or how have you solved fine-grained authorization maybe 10, 15 years ago. What are the challenges today to deploy an application in the cloud um, uh, and how to address that? Then I will give um, a brief introduction about Apache CXF edits and we'll make some demos. Um, based on the FedEx and STS use cases, which are also shipped as part of um, uh, Apache FedEx. And then the more uh, interesting part, especially also for, for the cloud, is that the role of the relying party IDP. I will come in details then to that. And finally, I will end the presentation with a short outlook of, 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 of the roadmap of FedEx. So how did um, uh, application security look like um, uh, 10 years ago? So you had maybe single sign-on solutions in place very often with a reverse proxy in front of the applications, but you were using some kind of proprietary protocol between the proxy and the backend application and also some proprietary single sign-on tokens. This means that you need the same product or the same solution at the reverse proxy side for the application server and for the central security service. So therefore you do have a, a tight coupling to this um, uh, vendor. And also very often that the backend application is um, uh, validating the security tokens against the central security server again. So, which is an additional remote call and additional, additional dependency. And uh, the only thing which was really supported or which is also standardized by JEE or by, uh, by .NET is uh, role-based access control. But usually this is not sufficient to authorize um, uh, users what they can do with your applications. Another thing is um, uh, user and ID management was all internal within your company. So it was not very flexible to integrate other ID systems. So what are the um, uh, security challenges? More for um, uh, non-IT um, uh, companies, they are thinking about should I uh, buy a product or buy a solution um, out in the cloud or should I build it on my own? Um, and, uh, and another th a challenge they have is that they might deploy solutions in their own data center, but to be more uh, flexible, agile, could uh, to better scale, they, they are thinking about hosting the applications in the cloud. For um, uh, companies which are providing software um, uh, as a services, they do have the challenges, how can they integrate the different 
um, uh, B2B customers, they do have they do have their own ID system. How can they integrate that into their applications without replicating all the user information or provision all the user information out into the cloud, which is also again a security risk. So yeah, that this was this point. And finally, um, how can an application deployed in the cloud get access to user information? Because based on this user information, you can then do some, uh, some, some sort of access control. Maybe where the user is located, um, uh, in which um, organization level he is aligned, what his functional roles are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The challenge there is that usually this information is available on premise in some of the sys uh, IDM systems, but you can't ac access that from 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 the cloud. And you want to avoid replicating what I mentioned before, this information to the cloud solution. And finally, um, uh, due to the fact that everything which went beyond role-based access control was developed customly within the application, um, uh, you always have there a lot of security code, a lot of complexity in your application code instead of really concentrating so that you can focus on, um, uh, on, 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 the, on the business code of your application. So these are the, the, the challenges when you want to deploy something in the cloud and integrate with or combine that with, um, uh, with the IDM system that you have uh, on premise. So, what, what are the gaps? I already mentioned the uh, fine-grained authorization, everything beyond is application specific. You do have this tight coupling of custom security components from the cent central server, the, the reverse proxy and the agent or the proxy agent, whatever in front of your application. These all are communicating with each other in a proprietary fashion and therefore you are tightly coupled. You are also tightly coupled to a single um, uh, user domain because as soon as you have to integrate an additional uh, LDAP directory, yeah, what are you doing? You can start um, uh, adding some more sophisticated logic in your application to either uh, check it against this LDAP directory and against the other LDAP directory. So there are different ways how you could address that, but you do have a lot of security code within your application. An interesting um, uh, point is that you are not really agile in integrating another um, customer, a B2B customer, like uh, you are providing a service like um, Salesforce.com, and you are, want to integrate now that with another uh, with an insurance company. Um, uh, till till you have integrated and provisioned all the users from this insurance company into your system, you are already replicating everything. This takes quite a lot of time, and especially it's also a, a, a security risk because. What happens if the employee from this insurance company is leaving? The user and the credentials are still in the salesforce.com um, uh, um, application, so he can still log in there. So you have to manually deprovision the user there first. And uh, when sometimes you might, you, you can have different kind of authentication mechanism like username and password or Kerberos or maybe a two-factor authentication, but all that was usually built in, uh, in your application code. Of course, there, there are frameworks out there like, like Spring Security, um, uh, for instance, where you can decouple that a little bit, but it's still part of your application bundle. A ver very important gap is 
uh, when you do have in, uh, is, uh, implemented the web single sign-on for your web applications, and you are then interacting with um, uh, web services, and you would like to trigger this request on behalf of the logged-in user, there was no real solution in place because the vendors providing web SSO solution didn't care about web services and the web services solution didn't care about how to integrate with a um, web application. So this was also a, a big gap. And finally, when an application developer once <coughs> starts testing its, its application, how can he do that if the authentication authorization is based on some central servers like reverse proxy and, uh, and the central security server. You can't deploy that on, um, uh, on, your, or on your machine. So we had some uh, kind of mechanism in the application to maybe disable it or have a complete different kind of security mechanism when you are developing locally and when you deploy it then into user acceptance test environment, it's completely different and it fails. So <coughs> these are the gaps where we were um, uh, looking and finding a solution um, which is um, uh, much more flexible. The key things were, on the one hand, we want to have this indirect trust relationship to the security server, which means that the, the application server doesn't have to go to the security server to validate the ticket or, or whatever. He can just, based on the information he is getting or based on the ticket he is getting, he can validate on that on its own. It will reduce the load on the security server. Then user information, which are required for the fine-grained authorization, um, uh, are push to the application instead of the application has to pull this information. And that, that's, that's, this was a key thing. All the different kind of, of authentication mechanism, username, password, Kerberos, whatever, we wanted to avoid that every application has to repeat that or re-implement that again in their application. So instead, we want to externalize the whole authentication process to a central server, which means if one project has a requirement for maybe two-factor uh, two authentication, we implement that once in the central security server, and every application which also wants to benefit from this um, uh, feature can just configure that and use it, but they don't have to care about it. Um, and the whole thing, I mentioned before, the mock testing, it should be quite a lightweight um, uh, open source um, solution so that you can really run everything locally in a, simplif a simplified <coughs> um, uh, fashion. Uh, and last but absolutely not least, everything should be based on industry standards so that we don't have the coupling to a single vendor in all the components central security server, reverse proxy, and application, um, so that these components, they still exist, or you still need them, but they are communicating based on a standard or based on an industry standard. So, what is the solution or what is the standard we found um, uh, to achieve that? So. We decided there to, um, uh, for the WS Federation specification, which is an OASIS um, uh, standard since 2009. A very key thing is it's, it does not mandate any kind of security tokens. You can use um, uh, SAML 1, SAML 2, or a custom token, even for a migration path when you still have custom security tokens in place and you need to support still both. You can do that with this um, uh, with this solution because it's uh, token agnostic, and th the key thing there is it it leverages the WS Trust also an Oasis standard, which defines as the so-called security token service. We see it a little bit later, 
which is responsible to issue security tokens, to validate um, security tokens, and it's quite a flexible API to also add um, additional information into the issued security token about the user. These are the so-called claims. This is also a ter term which has been introduced in the WS Trust um, uh, specification. Th the cool thing is um, uh, WS Federation is really the only standard which really reuses something which can be used on the one hand for the web application single sign on and on the other hand for web services. We will see that later and also we am, uh, in the demo. What we are using from our uh, federation specification is this passive request profile. And due to the fact that WS Trust is, is, is a web service, or is, um, you can only call it as a, as a SOAP client, um, this is not a, a browser is not able to make any SOAP calls. So the idea of the passive request profile of WS Federation um, uh, is to adapt the semantic you have and the capabilities for a browser to map that to the semantic of WS Trust. Usually then just by uh, mapping some elements in the, in the WS Trust call to, to parameters, HTTP parameters, query parameters. Um, the other thing is that an application which is then deployed in the cloud doesn't need connectivity to an IDM system. So the only piece which needs a con connectivity to the application and to the uh, IDM system is the browser. And of course, WS Federation also supports different kind of uh, authorization, uh, authentication um, uh, domains, what we will see uh, later also. Any questions so far? Okay, because the security token service of, of WS Trust plays such a key role, I will just explain it um, uh, quickly. So what we have here, and this is also standardized by WS Trust, is this security token service. We do have here the, the, the web service, which is protected by the STS, and the web service client. So initially, you start by sending a request to the STS, providing some sort of um, credentials for authentication. The, the STS will validate these credentials and issue a security token. Whatever kind of security token you requested, that's just the parameter, um, a, a constant you are sending to the STS. And then the web service client is adding this um, security token to the, to the web service call. The service will validate that has a trust relationship with the STS. So for instance, if it's a SAML token, the SAML token is signed, the service must have deployed here the, the certificate of the STS so that he is able to validate the, 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 the SAML uh, token on its own without having to go back to the STS for validation. So what, that's also the, uh, the reason why we combine WS Federation with SAML to reduce this requirement of to having this co uh, connectivity. Okay, he validates a token, is doing the, the, the business logic, and then sending the response back. The, 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 the cool thing here is um, uh, the client itself doesn't have to really to understand that the security tokens the target web service needs. So the service can provide some um, security policies. In there, there is, there is some information what kind of token he needs. Maybe this one needs SAML, uh, SAML 1.1 token, another SAML 2 token, and a third one, a custom token. Even if it's a custom token, in the response he's getting back, he would just take this snippet of the, uh, of the XML response and add it to the W security header. He doesn't have to care about it. It, um, uh, or validate the, the, the issued token. 
So that's quite um, uh, powerful in the combination of um, WS Trust and WS Federation. Um, uh, you can combine this. Also, um, uh, send here for authentication and have a speaker when the SDS is able to validate that. We use that uh, in our um, uh, deployments that you have the option either using username and password or Kerberos. So, the, 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 the CXF STS is supporting that as well. Okay. Okay, what is um, uh, Apache CXF Fed? It's, it's a sub-project of um, uh, Apache um, uh, CXF. The work started on Fed, it's at around uh, mid of 2011. The community um, uh, is, is, is still growing and we had um, uh, the first release last year um, uh, in June. It hasn't been updated yet, but Thanks to Colm, um, there's right now it's the release 103 um, uh, out, and we are finishing the work for the 11 release. I will uh, tell you uh, at the end what the new features are of the 11 release. <coughs> so, how does um, uh, FIDIS and uh, WS Federation fit um, uh, together? I will explain he here, we do have on the one hand, we do have uh, the, the user machine with the browser installed. We do have this central IDP identity provider and the security token service deployed as a central security server. FEDIS is providing there the, the FEDIS IDP and FEDIS STS, but FEDIS STS is nothing else than the CXF STS pre-configured for the requirements we have here for this um, uh, to, to fulfill um, uh, Doubles Federation with the browser. And on the other hand, on the relying party side where the application sits, we do have some sort of server container, the web application, and the FEDIS plugin. The plugin component which is responsible to see when there are unauthenticated requests trigger a redirect to the IDP, do the authentication challenge here, and issue it a token, post that back. The plugin will validate um, uh, the token and then create the internal um, security context of the server container. So that's the overall um, uh, architecture. What is very important here that all the authentication and issue of a, of a security token is here delegated to the FEDIS CXF STS. Any questions? Um, yeah. if, you better, if you have a federated identity or a federated set of identity providers, is it to the, uh, you know, oh, where oh. are you from kind of stuff? Yeah. The, uh, the home run discovery, you mean, I think? I will come to this uh, a little bit later. Is that okay? Here we see, just, uh, we see it a little bit in more detail, what is really going on. You see I'm accessing a resource in the, in the server container. I'm not authenticated, so I get redirected to the IDP. I have to log in there, post some credentials. Oh, this one here, I'm sending this sign-in request. That's a standard or standardized by WS Federation how this sign-in request has to look like and it's um, uh, parameterized, so you can um, define what kind of authentication mechanism you would like to have, what your home realm is, if you already know, and a lot of other information. Then he will log you, log, uh, challenge you once, create the sign-in response, which is um, uh, by default a SAML2 token, post this sign-in response, to the relying party and he will then validate that based on the signature and based on the trust he has here with the IDP. But there are no remote calls.
Um, the, 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 the number of features of the Apache CXF S tests are um, quite impressive. I have highlighted here the most important ones for the um, uh, to so, uh, which are used in in FEDIS. So on the one hand, we do have SAML 1.1, SAML 2. We do have the claim support, which are the uh, claims you made about the user or finally just user attributes. Um, claims transformation, that's an interesting for not only federating identities, but also federate claims, which brings you even more flexibility. It also supports intermediary, uh, the, the intermediary use case. I will show that later in, in an example with the on behalf of or act as um, uh, element. I think, yeah, these are the, the most important ones. So the FEDIS IDP and STS, when you download that, what, what you are getting there is you can, uh, authentication mechanism is right now only username and password. Um, uh, and you can then configure different kind of user stores. This can be for mock testing, just a file where you're entering all or adding all your users and roles and, and claims. Or, but it can also be uh, an LDAP directory or you can plug in another JAS um, uh, in a login module. For the claims or for the role store, you can use their file or um, uh, LDAP di uh, directory as well or write something custom, it's, it's an API, it's an interface, you can just implement and extend um, uh, the behavior. All the thing around customizing the, the creation of the SAML token is a functionality provided by the CXF STS, which is very pluggable, so you can just enhance that and use that also within, um, uh, within FEDIS. And the cool thing is a small footprint, so you can really start everything on your um, uh, local machine, the IDP, and, um, uh, and, and your application. And finally, when you are going into production, the only difference is that the IDP is sitting somewhere else. So then you are really testing the exact same functionality of the FEDIS plugin on your, in your development environment like it is later running in, in UAT or end production. The FEDIS plugin itself, which is deployed on the relying party side, on the application side, we are supporting Double Federation 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, SAML tokens 1.1 and um, uh, 2.0. We are supporting two types of trusts with the IDP, the, the so-called chain trust or direct trust. So direct trust means I have to import the certificate which has been used by the STS to issue the token. I must deploy that to the relying party. And if this <coughs> certificate expires, I have to update that. And sometimes um, this is, um, uh, um, uh, or a custom might, might have a more um, an, an easier solution without having to deploy the certificate every time. That's in the chain trust, which means only the CA, which has issued the signing certificate, must be deployed there. But additionally, you must define um, uh, the exact issue, uh, the exact subject name of the certificate. So. When this certificate expires, you must just must ensure that the, each, uh, the subject name is still the same. What was very important for the, um, uh, for the FEDIS plugin is that it's container independent as much as possible. So I would say 90% of the whole logic is container independent and we do have then adapters for different kind of containers. The current 103 release only supports Tomcat 7, seven but we are working now um, <coughs> uh, in supporting other containers as well. The FEDIS plugin is also able to publish the WS Federation metadata information, like there you can then see information like what are the required claims of the application, what is the certificate which is used um, uh, when you are using encrypting, encrypted tokens, um, uh, and so on. That's also, also standardized by the Douglas Federation specification. 
Now, when we, are, when we look at the API um, uh, level in Java, um, the two APIs you have is you can validate who is the user, get the user principle on the HTTP servlet request, and whether the user has a specific role. But all the additional information you might have about the user in the SAML tokens, you can't access. And we wanted to avoid that the applications have to write some processing logic for SAML tokens. So therefore, we introduced this federation principle which allows you to access these claims information very easily. So you can just get user principle and then downcast to the federation principle and then you can access the claims collection. And there is, okay, uh, here is the link, it's, it's, it's not correct. Um, that's for the, for the IDP, but everything is quite good documented. How to configure, what are the configuration options on the wiki? Um, what you have configured, I would just uh, mention the most important things is um, uh, on the plugin side, on the application side, is who is the issuer or where is the IDP, the URL of the IDP. You must define the realm of your application. That's just the, the scoping, naming context of your application. And then the rest are all um, uh, optional um, uh, parameters. So these two are, uh, are, are uh, uh, mandatory on, for a configuration side and uh, for the for the FedEx plugin. You can, but you can already control what kind of authentication mechanism you really want because it might be that the user is accessing some um, highly confidential um, uh, um, sites within your um, application. Therefore, only username password authentication is not sufficient. So you want something uh, like um, uh, certificate-based authentication um, uh, and whatever instead. So that's what you can configure there here. This is part of the sign-in request and to the IDP, and he will is doing then the authentication. On the application side, it's just configuration. Um, there are also um, uh, some extension points within the, the FedEx plugin. If you need to figure out what kind of authentication mechanism at runtime. So, um, uh, for instance, if you are accessing this URI within your application, you might have a requirement to, for a more sophisticated authentication mechanism. If you are accessing just the, the, the root context, then maybe the default is sufficient. So things like that you could handle here by the, the known um, uh, callback handler um, uh, interface or uh, API provided by Java. You can also customize security token validation. So if you do have a, a proprietary security token in place and you need support for that, it's easy to add this um, an additional validator to FedEx and uh, enable the validation of that. Here you see um, a, a simple example for the case for, for the home realm discovery. We come to this um, uh, a little bit later, but um, uh, it should just illustrate what you are what what you can do here. So. In, in every callback, um, uh, FedEx is uh, providing to you, you have access to the HTTP servlet request. So based on this information, you are getting their source IP um, uh, or whatever information, you can um, then, for instance, say, okay, my home realm is X, Y, Z. You set this on the callback, uh, uh, on the callback object and then this information is then sent to the IDP. And there's also some, uh, this is documented on, um, uh, on the wiki. Now, I mentioned um, uh, that there was a strong focus on uh, being aligned with industry standards, and the reason behind this is interoperability. 
and um, uh, um, reduce tight coupling to a vendor. So the FADIS plugin has already been tested with different vendors. So what we know, the FADIS plugin itself has been integrated, of course, with the IDP. Uh, with the FADIS IDP, this works. Adnovum is, a, is another company, closed source um, uh, company. We have validated the FADIS plugin with this um, uh, solution and with Microsoft ADFS. And on the ASP.NET side, the counterpart of FADIS in, 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 in Microsoft's world is the Windows Identity Foundation or uh, WIF. And we have also validated this with the FADIS IDP and with the um, uh, Novum IDP. I assume this one just works, but I haven't tested it, so. The interesting uh, thing here, here with this Adnovum IDP is we have integrated the CXF STS, so the whole responsibility to issue the tokens, validate the tokens and so on, is within the CXF STS, and the Adnovum IDP is only responsible to map the, the semantic of the STS to plain uh, HTTP um, uh, parameters and so on, so to interact, to be able to interact with the browser. So, as, as part of um, uh, when you download FIDIS, there are two examples there. I will first show the simple um, uh, web application. What we see here is the IDP component, the STS, the browser, and my web application. And here it's the same mechanism as I illustrated um, uh, before with the redirect with the redirect here to the IDP, the challenge, the authentication, issue the token by the security token service, which is then validated here. These are the standards which are involved here, WS Federation 1.2, WS Trust 1.0, uh, SAML 2.0, and the OASIS identity meta, meta system is, that they are standardizing some claims because a, with a, a SAML attribute has a name and, and the value. And they are standardizing some names, um, uh, some, some claim names about for the user. For instance, uh, the, the street, the first name, the last name, the email address, and so on. Which means if you are aligned with this system <coughs> and another um, uh, system is also supporting this standard, you don't have to do any kind of mappings because it's a standard, standard kind of naming. The STS capabilities we are using here is um, uh, username in the demo now, um, uh, and the federation plugin is just SAML token validation with WSS4J and, um, uh, and open SAML. And I will just uh, run the demo now. What I do have here is, I do have a Tomcat instance where the IDP um, uh, is deployed and uh, an instance of Tomcat where the application is deployed. I have downloaded uh, download Apache Fedits uh, 103. So what you, all you have to do is copy these two WAR files in here to the IDP. Then let's start it. Can you see it at the back? Then for, for the relying party, let's start this one as well.
just build the application and deploy it in between just clearing cache. So I'm accessing now this Fedis Hello World um, uh, application. I don't have um, uh, a session anymore. I will log in now with Alice. Now we see here on the IDP that something is going on. And then oh, it's already back. And I'm now logged in to, to the application. I see here the role I have and uh, the claims <coughs> which were um, uh, configured for this user. And we also see the initial bootstrap token. The bootstrap token was the, the SAML token which has been issued by the IDP. and also the standard API to figure out out of the static list here, just for demo purposes, which roles the user has. And finally, I'm just casting to the federation principle to have access to the claims collection, and then I write all the claims out um, uh, to, the, to the page. And as the same for the, um, uh, for the for security. FADIS plugin, where is the deployment of the FADIS plugin itself? We do have here the Tomcat Reliant Party, and in here I do have FADIS um, subdirectory, and in here are all the, the, the required libraries you need for the FADIS um, uh, plugin. You see here the core, which is um, about this size, and the adaption for Tomcat is uh, maybe 10%. And also download this uh, when you have downloaded it here plugins Tomcat. Here you do have the libraries plus the instructions how to deploy the Tomcat. Do you have any questions so far? And how much time do we have left? Fifteen. Okay. Um, I guess I will just explain quickly this, um, uh, the second demo Bec um, uh, t to show you the integration of the um, uh, web single sign on with the web service stack. Here in gray, these were just the components which were involved before during the sign in. We do have here the web application and target web service I want to call. I do have initially, um, or the application here is in the position of the SAML token, which has been I in issued initially. So when he is accessing here or trying to call this service, he is validating the security policy of it, is detecting that it's an issued token policy, which means it must be issued by an STS. So he is sending a request to the STS and sending the, um, the initially uh, in the token initially issued by the STS on behalf of so that he is getting a new token which is understood and be able to validate it by the target web service. Also that is quite easily just run two times maven clean tom uh, tomcat redeploy and then uh, execute um, the, the JSP uh, I mentioned here and then the web service is called and the web service will then respond based on the web service context what the current user was and this is the same. But um, uh, because I would like to 
talk about the Reliant Party IDP, um, I will skip the demo. Okay, yeah, it has been mentioned before what happens if you have several authentication domains or requester IDPs. So WS Federation specification differentiates between a resource IDP or we call it sometimes Reliant Party um, uh, IDP and the requester IDP which is really doing the authentication. So the, the, the Reliant Party IDP issues the SAML token um, uh, in a completely requester independent format, which means finally the application doesn't care whether the, the, the requester IDP was from company A or company B, because both companies might have different kind of semantics and syntax how they want to express some claims. <coughs> and it's the responsibility of the relying party IDP to map or transform these claims into a, uh, into a unique format which is understood by the application or by all sort of applications you are providing to your customers. So this allows to integrate, for instance, a new B2B customers without touching your application at all. Because all you have to do is, when you know you need these 10 attributes and you have this kind of naming of these attributes, all you have to do is to have a generic transformation of the semantic the new B2B customer has in their system to this format you are understanding. And this is done within the relying party IDP and finally in, 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 in the STS. We, we see that here, so I, I, I do have here the re relying party, an application I'm providing to different kind of customers. I have here the relying party IDP where this home realm discovery functionality is deployed, which means the browser is, yep, the browser is accessing the application, gets redirected to here, and now it's the responsibility of the relying party IDP or of this mechanism to figure out who, where is his requester IDP. Is he from company A or company B? This can be based on the, on the URI you enter. This can be based on the source IP. This can be any kind of, um, uh, any kind of mechanism you can um, uh, implement here. So, then you are redirected. He has figured out that you are coming from um, adatum.com. So he will redirect the browser again to adatum.com um, IDP. He is doing the challenge. Authentication issues a token. is sending the token here to the relying party IDP. And now the relying party IDP will issue a new token and do the transformation of all the SAML attributes to a format which is understood by the relying party. So all you have to do when you are now adding additional B2B customers, adding here the logic to transform the SAML token which has been issued by another IDP to the format you are understanding here in the applications without touching them at all. Do you have questions um, uh, to this relying party concept and home run uh, discovery? I don't have a demo for, for that. The reason for that is right now FEDIS doesn't support the relying party IDP concept. So, but we are planning to have this for the, for the next release, for the, uh, for the next minor release for 1.1. The same for the, for the home realm uh, discovery um, service, which is a core functionality within the Reliant Party <coughs> IDP. We intended to add also support for the SAML um, uh, profiles, but we have to delay that 
to, to be able to issue the 1.1 one, one release a little bit earlier because it provides a lot of new functionality. We are planning to also support encrypted SAML tokens and uh, to also support SAML holder of key, which means the browser also needs a certificate to validate uh, against um, uh, the application. And we are supporting some more, um, uh, some more containers like Caraf, Jetty, and also um, uh, Spring Security. And Spring Security provides two options, either pre-auth authentication, which means container-managed authentication, which is, of course, the case in the current plugin for Tomcat and Jetty, as well as um, uh, the native uh, integration in, in, in Spring Security for, for FedEx, which means you can then um, uh, deploy FEDIS, for instance, also in, in WebSphere or WebLogic where there is not yet a native um, uh, um, adapter available in FEDIS. If you need more information, I'd recommend to go to the, to the wiki site. It's quite good documented how to deploy, um, uh, how to create um, a certificates and so on. There are some interesting blogs um, uh, about uh, security, but not only about FEDIS, also about um, uh, CXF and DSTS <coughs> from Colm, Dan, Sergey, and mine as well. So therefore, I would like to hand over to you for questions. Yeah. How did you come up with the name? <laughs> um, uh, I had to find uh, um, uh, or uh, make a proposal quite quickly. So our goal was to really provide some benefit for the business, to be more agile, to get more customers or more B2B customer. So it's just a combination of federation and business. Very easy, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Do you have a mechanism for logging out? Um, right now, right now not. We have um, uh, we have Jira um, open for that. Also vote for it. We had also feedback from in in the community what is about logout. Um, but the key thing is, let's imagine you are uh, working with different kind of applications. Some are um, uh, hosted on premise. Some others are hosted in this cloud provider. Some others in that cloud provider. And when you just click on one logouts, then you really have a single logout, which means you are immediately logged out from all the applications you had to sign in before. And after that, usually the discussion then um, uh, um, uh, stopped because this was not the intention we want to have, but we still have it on the roadmap to be really have it uh, feature complete. Is that part of the standard, the logout? Yes, yeah. That's also standardized, yeah. Are yes. all the configurations, configurations done through Spring configurations? Sorry? Are all the configurations done through Spring, or does it have its own set of configuration files? It's a separate um, uh, configuration file, because there's no Spring dependency in there. Only for the integration for Spring security, which will come with 1.1, one, one, um, there you do have the options uh, to do uh, that in the Spring configuration. Any other questions? Okay, then thank you very much for your attention.